As we continue on in our series in James, we come across something that is very powerful today. Two elements. The element of blessing and the element of cursing. And both of them have a power. A power to give life and a power to steal life. So which power do you want to live in? Now we live in a world where there's a lot of powerful things that are going on around us. We see that. And the day was July 16th, 1945. One of our B-29 bombers dropped an atomic bomb called Little Boy on Hiroshima, Japan. In that moment of devastation, one of the co-pilots was watching out the window. And he saw what he believed to be this mushroom rising, which seemed to go to the heavens. In that moment of devastation, the co-pilot was quoted, What have we done? In that moment of devastation, we see six years later, that same power that brought that devastation was used to produce electricity. Same source, different result. And when I look at the words of James, there's a lot of comparison even when it comes to us. We have the power to bring devastation and destruction into people's lives. But we also have the power to bring life, to bring hope into people's lives. Same source, different result. You know, James really challenges us in looking at this. You know, when he looks at this, he wants us to realize what we have. We have the ability to give life. Are we doing that? You know, we are quick to avoid murder. We're quick to avoid stealing. And as followers of Christ, I believe that we're quick to avoid drunkenness. But even with that being said, too often, we're very quick to assassinate fellow believers with our tongue. We bring about devastation with the words that we throw out. That is no reflection of Christ. And James is challenging us to look at this. I mean, I see it all over the place. Husbands stab their wives with words that go to the very core. Wives stab their husbands with words that bring destruction and belittling. Parents bring words of devastation to their children, and then we expect them to flourish under that. And children, you bring words to the family that lays it out just like an atomic bomb. These words can give life. Or take it. You know, words can build up or they can destroy. Same source, different result. And like an atomic energy, the tongue has the ability to do incredibly beautiful things. But it also has the capability to bring devastation and destruction. So when we talk about this and look at James, he's really challenging us with another test of faith. And he says, when you look at your tongue and how you speak into people's lives, are you giving life or are you taking it? You know, the object of this powerful thing called the tongue, I haven't come across anything that's been able to bring it under control outside of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, it's able to rein it in. It's able to redirect it so that it gives life, not take life. But outside of the Spirit, there will be no control. Outside of the Spirit, we will say things that will bring devastation. That's the sin nature of who we are. And this tongue, man, has it destroyed a lot of things. A lot of relationships. A lot of friendships. But you know, on more than one occasion, Jesus speaks about this. He said, what's in a person's heart inevitably comes out of their mouth. And when you think about going to a watering spring, You will know if that spring is good by the source that it provides. So what source are we tapped into? Is our life bringing forth life? Life Life-giving words? Or do we have words that are coming forth that steal life? Because what we're tapping into will be the evidence of what we say and what we do. But you know, the source of the Spirit is what James really wants us to focus in on. He wants us to realize that when that sinful heart is there, that is what's going to come out of it. 
is a sinful nature. But when we live in the Spirit, we're able to abide in the Spirit. We're able to give truth that is life-giving. Now, James has already talked to us earlier in this series about being quick to listen and slow to speak. Do you remember that? He really challenged us on that. But I want to take it one step further today. Not just being quick to listen and slow to speak. I want us to think before we speak. It's just a simple acronym, THINK. You can write it down if you want, but I'm just going to walk through this. If you think before you speak, and you break it down this way, the T, is it true what you're speaking? The H, is it helpful? The I, is it inspiring? The N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? If you think before you speak and you use this simple filter, you will have a life-giving word for somebody But if we don't think and don't align ourselves with the Spirit, it's hard telling what will come out of this mouth. Because I know when it's not controlled by the Spirit, it runs a course that is very destructive. Now, maybe that's just my tongue. Maybe you got yours under control. But I know I need the Spirit in my life to control this thing. But you know, when our words become more than a statement of faith, when we really live out the reality of truth, when it's not just mere words, we begin to live out the Great Commission. We begin to to go and be the church, not just talk about the church. But you know, James brings to us this morning what I want to call the very first thing we look at, the beautiful challenge to go deeper. Now, when you read this, these verses, you may say, it doesn't sound like a challenge to me, but I see it as this, the beautiful challenge to go deeper. Now, isn't that why we're here anyway? I mean, really, are we not here to grow? Are we not here to go deeper in our faith? Or are you just here to be entertained? Because if you're just here to be entertained and to have your ears tickled, this is not the place for you. But if you want to grow in Christ and go deeper in your faith, James is saying, listen up. Listen up and change the way that you speak. Let your testimony be a reflection in your words and in your action. So turn with me to James. We'll look at this and start in chapter 3, verse 1. And he begins like he has begun a lot of the other scriptures. Dear brothers and sisters, what have we already learned? When he addresses that, he's saying, family, this is a family issue. Dear brothers and sisters, he considers them more than just acquaintances, more than just friends. This is family. And he says, we've got to figure this out. So dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongue, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. When you initially read that, does that sound like a challenge to go deeper? Or does it sound like a warning? I think at first glance it kind of looks like a warning, doesn't it? Man, if you're going to teach, you better understand the, the responsibility and judgment that comes with it. So a lot of you may say, ooh, I'm out. I don't want to teach. I don't want that responsibility. But that's not what James is saying. It's deeper than that. This is really a challenge for all of us. Because you're going to learn very quickly that we're all teachers at one level or another. And we all are going to be held accountable for what we do. But James knew that many of the people here really weren't taking their faith very serious. They were just casually approaching it. And what they were in church didn't look quite like what it was outside these walls. Now, how many of us are guilty of that? How we talk around the Christian family and how we talk outside these walls, does it line up? Does it match up? I mean, if I gave you a recorder and said, carry it for a week, would you let me do that? And let me listen to your conversations during the week? What would it sound like? What would be coming out of this mouth behind closed doors? Well, don't forget, it's not just about what we speak. It's about what we think. Because some of you may say, i got control over my tongue. But if you're thinking the thought, you might as well say the word. Because it's the same in the eyes of God. Do we see this as a privilege, church? Do we see being a part of the body of Christ as a privilege? And an awesome responsibility. He's put us in a position of influence, each and every one of us. Not one is greater than the other. But we're called to do this together. And if you think by not being a teacher in the church that you're off the hook, 
let me help you expand your understanding. Because influence is what God has called us to. So each of us have our stage. Your stage may not look like this, but you have a stage. And God has given it to you. And how you use that stage to speak truth and speak life into people is absolutely important. So what are you doing with the stage of life that you have? What words are you using to declare the glory of God? You know, there's a few uh, realities that James gives us right here in these few verses. The first reality is this. We all make mistakes. That's kind of encouraging. We're all on the same page. We're all in this together. The reality is that we all need Christ in our lives. We all need the message of hope. And that message has been spoken, and we have received it. So why aren't we giving it out? Why aren't we giving that message of hope if that reality is true, that we've all made mistakes? Even playing field. One is not greater than the other. But yet, we all need the Lord, and we all need forgiveness. Another reality that we find is that when we invite sin into our lives, we begin to have a life divided, a life of war between the flesh and the spirit. That's what the reality is. And he says we have to get control of these things. I mean, we can look back all the way to the, the first man that walked the earth, Adam. He walked in perfection with God. He heard the voice of God. I can't even imagine what that was like. But yet that moment was taken when sin entered into the world. And here we find Adam using words to backpedal. He backpedals in, in his action, doesn't own it, and he says, it was that woman. She's the one that caused me to sin. And he didn't stop there. He continued with his words. And he blamed God. God, if you wouldn't have created this woman, I wouldn't be in this mess. You're in this mess because you chose to be in this mess. But he didn't use his words wisely. And they were not life-giving. We have to own them. You know, the reality of what James is saying is every word that we speak and every thought that we have and every action that we carry out, we are accountable for it. Each and every one of us. We don't need to be afraid of that. James is saying, look at the challenge to go deeper. Do you want to bring glory to God or shame to his name? That's your choice every day. Do you want to bring glory to him or shame to him? It happens through our actions and our words. So what are you speaking? Words of life or words of death? Now, whether you like it or not, we're all teachers. Because somebody is watching your life. Somebody is observing the words that you use. So it's absolutely critical that you realize that you are on a stage for Christ. Every day, in every way, we've got to speak truth. And we have to live this out. You know, making the most of every opportunity, we hear this in Scripture. Do we take advantage of those moments to speak? truth, to give truth. You know, I kind of came across a, a story of a young boy who was leaving church one Sunday morning and he walked up to the pastor and he hands the pastor a dollar bill and he says, can you put that in your pocket? The pastor's sitting there going, okay, um, why are you giving me a dollar bill? What's this for? And the boy says, because I feel bad for you and I want to help you out. Now the pastor's even more confused about this and he's sitting there going, why do you feel like you have to help me out? And what do you think I need? He says, well, my daddy says that you're the poorest pastor he's ever heard. So I just thought you needed a little something. So, so I already have my dollar in my pocket, so I don't need any more, okay? All right? But the point of the matter is this. If we don't take advantage of the stage that we have, whether how big it is or how small it is, we have to speak words of life. We can't have people walk away and say, they didn't give anything to me. They didn't pour anything into my life. They only stole from me. They only belittled me. Your words are absolutely critical. And the stage that you have is a stage that God has called for you. You know, most of us would probably be surprised at the lessons that we teach every day with the words that come out of our mouths. How would you feel if, if we were able to stand around the corner of your life? What would we hear? It doesn't matter what I hear. God hears it all. And if we have claimed to be a follower of Christ, then we need to realize that he's walking with us step by step. So what comes out of this mouth and what comes out of this heart is truly our testimony unto the king. 
So I think we need to listen to what James is saying here. Because he talks about the tongue. And he says, when you are in a position to give and you don't, you're going to be held responsible and accountable for that. And he says, even the greater position of influence is the greater responsibility and the judgment that will come to you. He's saying, we have to own this. We have to realize what is at stake. People's lives are at stake by what we say and what we do. So this true test of faith that James is talking about, the tongue thing, are your words pointing people to Christ? Because if they're not pointing people to Christ, they're pointing them to condemnation. And you may say, no, I'm not. But if you don't give them the message of hope, what are you giving them? Think about it. If you don't point them to Christ, you can't get to the Father except through the Son. You're giving them condemnation. You're giving them no hope if you're not speaking the words of Christ. Through our actions and through our words, do you see how critical it is? We have to be understanding what James is talking about. We can't just be together and listen. You know, so many times we want to use this tongue to control and manipulate. And some of you are better than others. And some of you are a few words. And some of you are just like, do they ever stop talking? You know, everybody's a little bit different. But everybody has a voice is what I want you to hear. But with that voice, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to control the environment? Are you trying to gain position or power? What is this all about? I mean, now you think about it even in the church. What is this all about, this church thing? I mean, why do we come? Why do we gather? Is it just because we want to be seen? We just want to clear our conscience? We just want to have a, a position or a voice that somebody will hear us? Or are we actually coming because we realize that it's not about control. It's the fact that we're out of control. And we realize that outside of Christ, we have no hope. That's why we should be coming. And that's why we should be listening. And that's what we should be giving to other people. Now, I look at you guys. You look pretty proper and somewhat normal. I'm just kidding. You guys look great. You're a great crowd. But when I think about this, it's not just about walking and talking. But it's about being real with the person of Jesus Christ. And when it is, it's about going deeper in our faith. And that's what James is challenging us for. He says, don't avoid being a teacher. Understand you are a teacher. Every one of you. And when we approach the church, he's not calling us to casually walk in. He's asking us to seriously walk in and understand what is at stake in the lives of others outside of Christ. In Ecclesiastes 5, there's a great picture into what this approach to the church should be. What should this, the approach to God should be? The care that we should be taking with our words and with our actions. Listen to this. In verse 1, it says, As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Too much activity gives you restless dreams. Too many words makes you a fool. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through, for God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Don't let your mouth make you sin. Don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry. And he might wipe out everything you've achieved. Talk is cheap. Like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. Man, when you hear that, it should stir you to the very core. Because there's a responsibility with the words and the promises that we make to God. You know, what are we offering to God? Is it just mere words that, of empty promises of love, of growth, and commitment? Is it more than that? Are we just busybodies always talking about what we could be? And never serious about what we should be in Christ? Do you know how many times 
I've had people talk to me and tell me all the things they want to do for Jesus, and it never becomes a reality. Why? Because they're often filled with empty words, words that are filled with excuses. And right here in the scripture, we see this. He says, don't make promises to me that you're going to follow me, that you're going to deepen your walk. He said, I'd rather you say nothing than make promises and not do it. He says, your word is your bond. And your word is your testimony. Church, we have to realize this. The world is listening. And what are they hearing? What are they hearing from our lives? We say one thing and do another? What kind of testimony is that? Our words need to match up to our actions. You know, when we say nothing, we have no influence. But he's given us a voice to have an influence. Can one word change the perspective of how people see you? Absolutely. There is so much power in one word. But sometimes we don't see a word. It's small, right? It really can't change that much, can it? Sometimes we overlook the small things in our lives, those small words in our lives. It seems that everybody remembers those big moments in our lives, those wow factors, those favorite times in our lives. We all talk about it. But sometimes we forget that it was often the little things, the small things that orchestrated that plan to the big thing. I mean, everybody wants this mountaintop experience with God. And they don't realize that sometimes it means reading and praying and serving to be able to get there. They just want the mountaintop experience, but they don't want to do the things that are necessary to get there. And oftentimes we don't overlook what some would say, that's a small thing, right? Reading your Bible, that's a small thing, right? Praying every day, no. It's a huge thing. All these things add up to the perfect orchestration of God. And in that orchestration, our lives change, our voice changes, and our actions change. So do the smallest things really matter? Do they? Well, James believes that they do. If you turn with me to James, we'll pick it up in verse 5. He talks about these small things I think you can identify with. He says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Man, I've heard a lot of great speeches that have come from this. But in this moment, James is saying, take a moment. Understand the power of these small things. He takes, for example, the horse. I don't know how familiar you are with horses, but they weigh on average about 1,500 pounds. A lot bigger than we are. But yet, the small bit weighing less than a pound can allow you to get up on this beast and guide it through this bit. One-tenth of a percent of its body weight can control that wonderful, beautiful beast. But then you look at the ships. He uses this thing called a rudder to guide the ship. These ships today, on average, these cruise ships, are about 40,000 tons. And if you don't know what a ton is, try this. 80 million pounds is what they weigh. But yet this little rudder, which is... 1.5% of the total volume of the ship controls it, guides it. It's incredible how this little thing, in comparison, can direct this huge ship. But then we get to this tongue. I don't know how much you know about a tongue. They're not the most beautiful thing. They weigh about two, three pounds. But yet, in comparison to the average weight of a human being, again, it's 1.5% of the total weight. This little thing can control a lot of what we do. A lot of what's inside will come out of this tongue. And people will know us by what we say and what we do. So small things do matter. And they can control. Without these small things, there is no control. Now, there is a difference. If you look at the tongue versus the horse bit and the rudder, here's the difference. The horse bit and the rudder, without guidance, they can cause no harm, but they also can give no guidance. But the tongue is what? It's connected to the guide, us. And what we guide it with is what we are giving to the world around us. So what are you saying? Are you giving words of life or words of death? 
James continues to challenge us. We pick it up in, in the latter part of verse 5. It says, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. Have you ever heard that before? That's pretty strong terms that, that James is using. That our tongue is set on fire by hell itself. Do you know what that means to me? That our words can be the open door to hell in our home. Our words from our tongue can be the open door to hell in the church. We can bring that kind of devastation here by this little thing. And that's why James is saying, get it under control. And allow the Spirit to guide it. Because it needs to give life, not take it. You know, I love to play with fire. I learned that as a young age, but I learned that just a little spark can turn into a huge flame of destruction. You can just ask my mom sometime about that. It's a story I probably shouldn't be telling. But anyway, the spark, when it comes to our mouth, it can, it can sound kind of like this. Did you hear about, did you know that when we start that spark of gossip with our tongue, we start that spark of confusion with our tongue. The temptation can come to us from a different angle. Somebody could offend you with the words that they say. And what's our reaction? We want to have a defense mechanism. And oftentimes that defense mechanism is throwing words right back at them. That's the temptation. That's the spark that can turn into a flaming fire that can burn down everything that you have tried to establish in your faith. One word, one conversation can steal the testimony of Christ. So where's the hope this morning? When we talk about this tongue and all the devastation that it can bring, the hope is in focusing on Christ and understanding what beautiful things this tongue can bring forth. Words of encouragement, words of life. But don't be ignorant to what it also can destroy. So what source of life are you drawing from? We started there. I made mention of that. What well of life are you dipping into? What's your source of life? When you read this in verse 7, it says, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. That is what James is saying to the church. Why are we doing this? Why are we destroying one another with words? He's saying it's not right. It shouldn't be. But words are powerful. We bless with them. We build them up. We curse with them. and We tear down. And this is an actual conversation that we see all throughout Scripture. In fact, in Proverbs 18.24, here's what Solomon says. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Now that might sound like it's been overstated. But as I was preparing my sermon, I came across some research that often hits the media. And it has to do with teenagers, college students that are taking their lives because of words that have been spoken into their lives. It's not an encouraging newscast when you walk this through. Over the last three years, there's been hundreds and hundreds of students, college students, teens, young adults, who have taken their lives not because they're depressed, not because they have a chemical imbalance, because they've had an unstoppable Badgering, belittling, mocking of their lives by their peers via social media or face-to-face. -face. They take their lives because they've been belittled by words. So yes, words can bring life and Lord, words can steal life. But you know, you read this, read on in Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 18. It says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. So here we have another instance where it can cause wounds or it can bring healing. And I think if we talk about wounds, 
I think we're all there at some level or another. Somebody has spoken words into your life that have cut you to the core. And you know exactly what they are. It doesn't matter how long ago they were. That wound may still be there. Why? Because words are that powerful. And when you look at that, it's a sad thing to say. We need to think before we speak. I know for Michelle and I, we've been in ministry for 20, 26 years. And some of the meanest things that have ever been said and done to us have come from the people in the church. And James is saying it shouldn't be. And I know if it's coming to me, I know we're doing it to one another. And James is saying we can't go there. We have to change this. We have to be a voice of blessing. A, b- a voice of encouragement to one another. It's easy to belittle. It's easy to discourage. But in the power of the Spirit, that's where we can bring life. And give life. You know, so many people are not equipped to be attacked by words. Especially our kids today. How do we send our kids out into the world to be ready to receive all the cruel things that are said and done to them as they grow up in school or on the playground? I mean, do we send them forth with the word? Do we give them the word of God? Do we let them know their identity in Christ so they know where they stand? Or do we allow them to live in those petty little weak poems sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me who wrote that words hurt words cut to the core and we cannot live in that defense mechanism and think that's sufficient i mean i like one of my favorite ones i think uh, the kids wrote this one goes like this i'm rubber and you're glue whatever you say to me bounces off of me and sticks to you is that really what we want to give our kids as a defense to fight these words we got to give them the word. And when they have the word to stand on, they will have a foundation that's unshakable. But church, I'm going to tell you, once again, you cannot give to your children and grandchildren something you do not have. If you do not have the word of God in you, it's going to be very difficult for you to give the word of God to them. But we're called to speak these words. We're called to understand. Now, these final verses in verse 11... It says, does a spring of water bubble out with fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So what that means to me is as followers of Christ, if we're to produce life, life life-giving words, then we have to be connected to the vine. And being connected to the vine, which is Christ, we will have that ability to do so. The fruit of our lives will be the indication of who we are connected to, what the source of life we have ourselves. What have you planted in your heart? The seed of life blessing or a seed of destruction and devastation, cursing and confusion? Are you drawing from a well of life or a well of wishful thinking that is empty and bitter? You know, James says that this is not a tongue issue. It may sound like it, but what he's really saying is this is a heart issue. And it doesn't matter what topic we talk about, church, it's always going to be about the heart. We have to take the word of God and allow our heart to hear it and in turn be able to become what Christ needs us to be. But even with that, I love how Luke states this, this idea. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says a good person produces good things from the treasury in a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. That is the truth. That is the reality of where we are at. I didn't mean it, Pastor. I mean, it just kind of came out. I don't know where even that came from. I know where it came from. You're not tapped into the right source. And I know some people will even use humor and you're really good at it. You want to get your point across? You still want to cut to the core? You'll throw some humor on it and say, oh, surely that'll get by. They won't think that I'm being critical of them. But yet we are. We may even say, I'm, I wasn't thinking when I said that. And I say, you know what? You probably weren't thinking. But yet, from your heart, from that source, is going to bring forth what you're connected to. So are we a people of blessing or a people of cursing? And I'm not just talking about swear words. I'm talking about 
life-giving words or words that steal and destroy. That's what I'm talking about. I want us to think before we speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? That filter will position us by the Spirit to give life to those that are desperate to hear the truth. But we have to be willing to speak it. We're not called to be silent. But we're called to be courageous and bold with the words that we choose. Let's pray.